while well, Spain's Deputy Finance Minister is visiting investors in London at present, looking to drum up support ahead of a bomb sale tomorrow. While well, Spain is working to get its finances in check, it slashed its deficit by almost half in the first 11 months of 2010. But bond yields have not come down, and now the government may find it hard to cut spending further without endangering the economy. Well, unemployment is now above 20 percent, and house prices do continue to fall. Well, I'm now joined by Spain's Deputy Finance Minister, Jose Manuel Campa. Mr. Campa, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, Spain has been at pains to point out that it will not go the same way as Greece and Ireland. Are you convinced at the moment that you will not need an IMF or EU bailout? Yes, we're fully convinced. You know, our economy has been adjusting very well. We've been engaging in the reforms that we think we need to take to make sure that we go into a growth but that is balanced and that's sustainable in the future. That's already starting to show up. It doesn't show up on the aggregate statistics, but we have a large part of the economy that's already performing very well, mainly linked to tradable goods, to industrial sectors, to tourism that is recovering. So we're quite, quite confident that we'll be able to recover from this. Now, Ms. Salgado said uh, this morning that the idea of a credit line is beyond all logic at the moment. Um, I think that uh, phrase at the moment has concerned people. Uh, does this mean that you will never need it or that you would like to keep the option open that you may need a credit line in the future? No, we're fully convinced that we will never need it because the amount of adjustment that the economy is taking place, you know, both on the fiscal consolidation part, you know, we've adjusted our fiscal plans according to the increase in the front loading that we have committed to in back in May of last year. We have not delivered on that. We are confident that we'll be able to also slash the deficit down to 6% of GDP this year. Right. So we are fully aware of the challenges that, we are, that lie ahead of us. We are taking the measures. We just uh, announced, the government just approved just on Friday, uh, an ambitious reform of the pension system with mm. broad support from the social partners as well. So we're quite confident that we'll be able to manage the situation in the economy, that the economy is slowly going to turn around and that we can manage with our own means. Now, it would appear that the uh, EFSF uh, will, uh, you'll be able to buy, will be able to buy bonds directly from governments. Is that something that you think Spain will use? Well, we don't think, I mean, this is a process that's going on the FSF. Mm. On that front, what we've been very clear about is that we would like to support any ideas that come up with a stronger euro, with more European integration, a stronger commitment to euro area stability. You know, to use the facility in a more flexible way, that's certainly something that could be useful for mm -hmm. any situation in the future or that we are confronting right now. But in no way do we think that this is something that we're viewing it as specific for Spain to Not use. Not just for you. Yeah. Now, inflation, um, we've seen it uh, higher in the peripheral nations than it is in, uh, in the core of Europe, and inflation is high. If there was a rate hike, how worried would you be about the impact of that on, on your economy, particularly with a, with a high debt burden? Well, first of all, inflation is higher in the periphery and it's higher mm. in Spain as well, yeah. but it's partially due to the effort of fiscal consolidation. You know, we have increased VAT taxes, we have increased taxes on gasoline and tobacco. Those are of taxes that go directly into inflation because mm. they're taxes on final consumer products. So are you concerned about a rate hike? No, we're not concerned about a rate hike. First of all, because subdued inflation seems to be still uh, within target of the ACB. Second, because if the rate hike comes as a result of European recovery, that would be good news for us because certainly we are uh, doing very well with our export sector. A European recovery will encourage our exports and will foster our growth and that would be good for us overall. Now, let's move on to the Cajas. It seems clear that the government doesn't want to lose money buying into these Cajas. So does that mean it's going to buy them at very distressed uh, valuations? Is that, what kind of impact is that going to have? No, well, what the government has announced, and this is the most important thing from our point of view, is that we want to make sure that we have a very solvent financial system and that we convey that message to the rest of the world mm. so there are no doubts about it. That's why we have announced that we will increase minimum capital requirements and we're encouraging institutions precisely because we think they're solvent to go out to the market and to raise that capital on their own. So we have provided a backstop in case that's not feasible for all of them. So would the government consider um, offering guarantees to make it easier for the Cajas to sell impaired assets and, and therefore clear up their balance sheets? The government has put forward the strategy to increase capital requirements and we're encouraging them to increase capital and we will provide the capital on market terms if they are not able of providing mm -hmm that in the market. Do you think at the end of this any of those kind of old style Cajas, the pure savings banks in regions are going to survive? 
Absolutely. I mean, we have a large number of cajas. We have 45. They've engaging in processes that have brought them down to 17, but there are a mm. few of them that have very, very successful business models that have been following very good service to their customers, that have conservative funding strategies that makes them less reliant on wholesale financial markets, and they're very, very able to manage this business going forward. So there's no reason why they would not survive. Now, you, you mentioned uh, the new stress tests. Uh, on those stress tests, what kind of levels of uh, criteria on sovereign debt would you like to see? Well, from, as you know, from our point of view, sovereign debt is not really the big issue. The biggest concern on the Spanish banking system has been the exposure to the real estate sector and mm. to the developments, particularly land and development projects. And we, already back in July, we were very aggressive in providing transparency and on the assumptions that were built on the stress test specific on this point on the Spanish sector and as we go forward with the European stress test exercise. They have again. to be tougher than last July's stress test though, don't they? Well to they probably have to be they probably have to be overall, but I think well, from our point of view is we have done back in July already a very aggressive scenario. We covered ninety eight percent of our financial system. You know, no other European country did that. We provide the disclosure at the individual level at much higher levels than any other European country. We're willing to do them as as tough as necessary. The most important thing is that they're credible. Mm, indeed. Now, several analysts, and I include Fitch in this, uh, have said that the September deadline for banks to reach those new capital levels is just too far off. Are you going to stick with that September deadline, or do you think that it should be moved sooner? Well, we don't think it's very far off. First of all, it's a deadline that's contingent on the institutions providing a financing plan of how they're going to recapitalize themselves. Mm. If any institution feels that they already want to and go to the FROP right away and find the public capital and the state, the state provided capital, that's only a possibility that's available for them. It's their choice. But when you think about other exercises that have been done, be it the European stress test exercises or the SCAP analysis in the US with the stress test scenarios, in both of those cases, the amount of time that was provided to institutions that had shortage of capital was at least six months. So this is certainly within the same range. Okay. Now, if we move on to unemployment, it is a major issue for you and all this reform that's been taking place on wages and wage bargaining. How far along this line have you come and how much further do you need to go? Well, we have, as you know, and as you're very, very aware, we have a very large unemployment rate. This is mm. by far the biggest challenge of our economy. We have engaged in a labor reform back in the fall, a labor reform that has shown some effects already. But as you mentioned, you know, collective bargaining is a big issue and mm. it's an issue that we need to work on. Fortunately, today, the social partners have agreed already on, and they're signing an agreement on the basics for compromise to be able to move forward on making better regulation of collective bargaining. We have a deadline that is March 22nd for, being put, for the reforms to be put forward. We're mm -hmm. looking forward to working with them and be able to have this by March. Now, what about youth unemployment? Because that really is a key issue for you. And what kind of reforms, what else can you put in place to try to shift that very high level of youth unemployment? Well, here the reforms are a little bit different. What you want to engage them is basically, first of all, the most important is to increase the employability of youth people, mm -hmm. of young people. You know, So we've been putting forward programs for training to encourage training. We just announced also that we're going to put forward a, a new part-time uh, contract that will allow them to work part-time with entitled benefits for the companies that hire them, that will have write-ups on the social security benefits that they have to put that they have to pay. And they need to provide at the same time more training. We're putting forward training programs for them, on-the-job training, not just formal training through education, but also on-the-job training. And we're hoping to encourage their employability. That's certainly key for because they are the future. Okay. And just before, before you go, you mentioned tourism. You think that tourism is actually coming back and that may well help to balance things out because obviously the construction sector really has, is, has still taken a dive and it doesn't seem to be coming back, does it? Yes, tourism, I mean, it's a, it's a cyclical industry, obviously, oh. you know, and to the extent that European economy is recovering and that we'll see higher growth rates in northern European countries, which are our customers, a large oh. base of a customer base, we see some recovery there. You know, uh, we have other traditional customers like the UK citizens, which were big customers of our tourism, especially of our long-term oh. residency status, you know, to the extent that the pound has been depreciated relative to the euro, has, that has not been helpful, but at the same time that the UK economy recovers as well, we look forward to having them back. We're okay. sure they'll be back. <laughs> okay, Mr. Campbell, thank you very much indeed for joining thank us Thank you.